up the live on YouTube, which is going to go in a minute. And then we can wait maybe another minute and start. So here we are. Welcome. Welcome to this presentation. I'm going to share my screen and start. Um, welcome to anyone who's just joined. I'm going to wait another minute or so before really kicking off. It's also live on YouTube right now. So some people might prefer to watch it that way. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone. Hello, Shannon <laughs> Um, so today I'm going to start slowly, slowly. So, so today we're going to talk about the five key skills to make an impact as a sustainability leader or professional in a rapidly changing world. Um, this is a framework that I've developed as um, the director and founder of Green Gorilla Consultants, and I'm going to share it with you today. So hopefully it's going to be, you know, about 45 minutes, a few questions at the end, if you have any. Uh, but I always start every presentation with this, this picture, because uh, uh, this has been recognized as the picture, the sort of mark the start, the start of modern sustainability. This is a picture taken by the Apollo 13 crew for the first, the first time they put a foot on the moon. And it shows how we're dealing really just with this, a little blue marble in the space. This is what we got. We haven't got infinite uh, resources, yet we act like we do, um, but we need to take care of it. This is what we have um, in spite of, you know, some people's aspiration to go in space and I don't know what they want to do in space. I'd rather, you know, live in this beautiful blue marble. So that's, you know, the way, and, and the way you behave as a sustainability professional and leader uh, will have an input on that. It will have an impact um, if you have the right skills to go ahead and help. So if you don't know me, uh, I'm Virginia Cinquemani. I'm the director and founder of Green Gorilla Consultants LTD, which is a training and coaching company focused on empowering sustainability professionals to make an impact. I'm also the author of a book called Sustainable Able, How to Find a Success as a Sustainability Professional in a Rapidly Changing World, um, which it sort of uh, summarizes the framework that I'm gonna talk about today. But I am a sustainability professional myself. I've been so for the last 16 years, so quite a long time. Uh, you, I originally was an architect, but the reason why I went into skills and uh, complementary skills, I say to uh, technical skills, is because I could see my coll colleagues struggling. Technical people sometimes don't know how to sell sustainability. They go ahead with their technical knowledge, you know, great, solid technical knowledge, but they might struggle to communicate that message and really to advance sustainability in the world. So that's how it all started about three years ago. So that's the book, Sustainable. Um, now, tell me, it's only a few of us, so it's great because we can, we can have a little bit of a dialogue instead of me just having a monologue. What do you actually struggle with? Um, do you struggle? So I'll give you some options and maybe you can type in the chat um, what do you struggle with in your sustainability work. Is it perhaps the clients or other stakeholders think that it costs too much or that is not necessary? Or maybe do you struggle with work-life balance uh, because it's a bit too much? Maybe it's only a few of you in a team. Uh, or if you're new to the sector, um, maybe do you struggle with uh, coming into the sector? So if you, if you want to type in the chat, what do you mainly struggle with with your sustainability work? We can, we can have a little bit of uh, a chat there. Yeah, I'll give you, you know, a minute. Tell me a bit about you. Or oh, we could actually, since it's only a few of us, so why don't you, oh, okay, Charlie, oh, I found the, I got a message now. Otherwise you can just unmute yourself and talk, it's fine. Challenge more on clients to understand how sustainability works for them. So you struggle to communicate how sustainability can work with your clients. 
Yeah, or you, the clients don't understand. Is that right? Possibly, yes. Okay, cool. Marielle, do you want to put something in there? If you want, that's fine. Otherwise, so we'll just move on. So, okay, so that is connected to the way you, um, you work in sustainability. Coming into this new sector with limited understanding about sustainability. Thank you very much, Shannon Law. Okay, we'll see. So for those that just joined, uh, we just started and we're talking about our own struggle with sustainability. What do we struggle with while working in this sector? And maybe it's clients who don't want to adopt it. Maybe they don't understand it. Maybe it's you and your life work balance. Um, or you struggle to make an impact. That's another one that many people uh, I work with have as an issue. So feel free to uh, pop it in the chat if you want to, and because it's only a few of us, it'd be great to get to know each other a bit more. Now, what uh, is success? Because the title of the presentation is that you want to find success as a sustainability leader or professional. Now, <laughs> this is uh, Scrooge. Um, we might not have the idea of success, or we might do, you know, maybe it's wealth, or maybe it's wealth along with other things. Now, for me, as a sustainability professional, and hopefully also for you, success looks more like this, psyche guy. If you are familiar with that term, I don't know, I'm going to explain it, is a Japanese concept, meaning a reason for being. And I love it because it really encompasses all that possibly makes everyone happy. Now, the concept of Aikigai was born in, in Japan because they found that some islands of Japan actually have people that live beyond 100 years in perfect health. So they studied them and they also found other people living in other islands around the world. Somehow it's, you know, the islanders life, um, they found that actually they do all of these things. So they use their skills, what they're good at. They also use their strengths, so what they love, what their passions. Uh, but also they do something that the world needs. And in our case, this is big, right? We work in sustainability, this is huge. The world needs us. But also you can be paid for it so that when you have the four element, what you're good at, what you love, what you need and what you're paid for, then you can you know, easily say you'll find your Aikigai. Success is progress to me. Believe that one passion and staying on until success. Absolutely. It's progress, absolutely progress. And that is, you know, I don't think anyone can say, oh, I got success now. But certainly we can feel in balance. And when we feel in balance, it's because we use all our skills, all our strengths, our values, and we get paid for it and we are contributing to the world. That's beautiful, isn't it? So for me, this is really what success means. And um, Plus, it's really interesting to see what this guy, Mark Carney, who used to be the governor of the Bank of England until recently, said. He said the firms that align their business models to the transition to a carbon neutral world will be rewarded handsomely. Those that fail to adapt will cease to exist. It's as simple as that. Sustainability is a new reality. Sustainability is here to stay. So we are in the right, uh, um, really in the right sector at the right time. There is actually a challenge though with that because it's becoming really trendy even. I mean, I was watching TV the other day and four ads out of four had an element of sustainability to it. Um, so that means it's really at the forefront of people's mind. Yes, at the moment, a lot of it is greenwashing. So it's perhaps it promises that are not fulfilled by, by facts. However, it's, it's becoming bigger and bigger. It's a huge economic opportunity, is, is a trend. However, because it is becoming an increasingly you know, crowded market, how do you differentiate yourself from the others? And hopefully I will show you today how you know the skills that you need to hone in order to make, you know, or you know, become successful in your own unique way. So effectively, it's going from monkey to gorilla. 
So what skills do you need? How can you become more impactful? And how can you progress your career? Because in the end of the day, we all need to work and progress. Now, if you can type in the chat, what do you reckon? Is it more, more important to have hard skills or soft skills or both? So your technical knowledge, your other skills, like professional skills like communication, negotiation, uh, people skills, I would say, or both. If you can just type in the chat what you think, that would be fantastic. Trying to make it a little interactive, as you can see. And I'm going to read the answers. OK. 50-50 for hard skills and soft skills. Soft skills are more than half hard skills. OK. OK. So truth is, you need everything. So without your hard skills, so your technical knowledge, you probably won't have enough credibility. You need that to be able to carry out the job that you do, whichever sector you come from, it doesn't matter. But soft skills are what takes you to the next level, to the leadership level. If you see, for example, all the good leaders in this world, they all have really good soft skills that they are good communicators generally speaking of course you know there are always exceptions but the best ones know how to employ their charisma they know how to make um you know things really um compelling for others so, so this is what we really need to focus on if you haven't thought about it which is very likely because I think school, university, even the workplace really focuses on hard skill, but very little in the way of soft skills. So I've interviewed, I've had this good fortune of interviewing really important people in the sustainability um, scenario, international people as well. So hopefully you know a few of them, like David Simons is head of Future Ready uh, in uh, WSP, um, big program around the world. Uh, Mike Barry is an influencer in sustainability. Jerry Udelson is a prolific author of sustainability books. Each one of them, and I've interviewed um, a lot more, you can find the interviews on YouTube, but they said that the hard skills without the capacity to communicate and influence others have zero impact. So they all focus on their soft skills. Once, of course, they are at a stage where they feel quite confident in their hard skills. So if you need to take away one thoughts, this is it. Really, you need to focus on communication and influencing. In particular, at Green Gorilla, we have come up with this framework in which we have the five key skills. Technical is really at the core of it. As I said before, you need it for your credibility. But then there is communication, there is resilience, there is selling, and there is also project management. And I'm going to explain them all in this presentation today. We say technical, obviously, it's a given, you have to have it. Uh, the challenge will be to keep it up. How do you keep it up? Now, super simple. LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. I don't know whether you knew about this webinar uh, masterclass via LinkedIn or other means, but it's really one, a friend of mine calls it my, my mini library. It is, it's your library in your pocket. You've got so much interesting content. Maybe the challenge is time. So LinkedIn is definitely one, but, and, but the main challenge is really to understand when to do your CPD, continuous professional development, when to read about sustainability, when you can do courses or CPD activities. Establish it, you know, have on your calendar that you do it on a regular basis, say every week and you read some stuff and you browse through LinkedIn and, you know, uh, watch videos, et cetera. But it has to be a regular keeping up and topping up uh, amount. Because for example, when I did my master's degree in 2006, um, say solar panels had a return on investment of 100 years, meaning if you put solar panels on your building, it will take you 100 years to recover the money. Now I think is below 10 years. So obviously my knowledge from that time, unless I kept it up, it would be really, really outdated. So absolutely fundamental to keep it up. But more importantly, let's go into the soft skills. Resilience. Now, I put the face of the nurse there because we know what we went through in the last couple of years. 
med the medical staff are probably uh, among the most resilient, well, you know, people in, on the planet right now. So an example to follow. But effectively, resilience is a capacity to bounce back from setbacks again and again. And as sustainability professionals, it happens very often, like, for example, somebody was saying, you know, my clients don't understand how sustainability applies to them. So it's all these little setbacks is people saying, oh, I don't understand, or no, it's not needed, or, you know, cost too much, um, or having that, you know, hurdle after hurdle that you need to uh, overcome. So you need your resilience. And plus, obviously, if you are in this sector, you, you know, chances are you are affected a little bit by eco-anxiety. You feel anxious about the state of the planet and you don't know exactly what to do. So there is a little bit of feeling perhaps of overwhelm or, um, you know, in certain cases, it's quite severe. Um, so I would say if that's the case, definitely see a doctor or a therapist. But otherwise, if you if you think you can cope on your own, there are certain certain techniques and certain strategies that you can use to become more resilient, which in turn will make you feel pos more positive about your role in the world, and um, yeah, and you'll feel less powerless. One reality is that we don't know what's in the future. I mean, who would have predicted the pandemic? Of course, some people sort of predicted it, but the majority of us didn't know it was going to happen. But there are other uncertain things like space travel is actually becoming, you know, I, I brought this a few years ago, this slide. And as we know, in the last couple of weeks, two different people went into space with their crews just for fun. So space travel is very much a reality, whether it's right or wrong, I don't want to get into a deep date, but anyway, everyone has his opinion. But we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So how, what certainty do you have about you know, the future? You've got none. So again, being resilient will help in transforming as well over time. It's really important to, to adapt to the times because it is rapidly changing. Everything is rapidly changing. Now, Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in jail, as you probably know. And then he came out and he became the president of South Africa. So if he's not, if he wasn't uh, the example of resilience, I don't know who could be. Uh, so I really like his quote, in life, sometimes you win and sometimes you learn. And that is the attitude that we should all have in order to become more resilient and also to learn. I mean, life is not perfect and it can't be all rainbow and uh, rainbows and unicorns. Therefore, we need to learn how to take the best out of it. And one way is to learn from our mistakes or learn from our setbacks or from people um, that don't treat as well, etc. So what, what is your learning point? That's the core element of resilience. What, what are you learning? So it's about reframing and rethinking your role, your life, what's happening to you, and put everything into perspective. So, for example, if you have a bad meeting, you know, where you feel deflated, it didn't go well, will it matter tomorrow? Will it matter in a month time? Will it matter in a year time? Chances are, unless it's a major life changing event, you won't even remember it in a year time. And so it's almost rethinking every time something bad or that you judge as bad because it's us putting filters to, in our lives. Is, is whether you can think, okay, is this going to matter tomorrow? And if not, just let it go as much as you can. Optimism for me doesn't mean Pollyanna and, you know, my life again is all unicorn and rainbows, but it's really giving the future a chance. How do I make sure that my future is going to be good or, you know, positive or they're going to make, a, I'm going to make a difference? Some of it is supported by what I do today. Of course, there are all the uncertainties that we were saying before, but planning, for example, is one good way of having goals and focusing on you know, good things in the future. It's just really try and see things, how things can be better in the future compared to what they are now. Um, or actually, uh, Christiana Figueres called this stubborn optimism, 
because so Christina Figueres was one of the main players in the Paris Agreement in 2015, um, as you probably know if you are in the sector. And uh, she talks about stubborn optimism, and I love that because it is important to give the future a chance. If not, we might as well, you know, go away and you know, shut ourselves in a corner and just cry. And what is, you know, I'd rather battle and fight until the end and be positive and try and make a difference than the opposite. So the opposite of optimism is really not very nice at all. So it's, it's all about looking at the silver lining, the learning, the learning that comes from the events that, go, that, that happen in our lives. And one little tip for you is to come up with some strategies that can keep you going. Um, again, things will go per shape at times, but how do you keep going? How do you keep happy? How do you keep healthy? What helped you in the past when you had challenges that you managed to overcome? Going back is really helpful sometimes just to see what can work for you. Everyone is different, but, you know, things like eating well, exercise, you know, the classic, meditation, journaling, uh, walking in nature, uh, swimming in the open sea, whatever it is that makes you feel alive, that gives you energy. Those are the strategies that you can use in the future. And I have maybe a list, a running list that you can pick and choose when you feel a bit, you know, deflated. Hitting the bottle is not a solution, uh, although it might feel on the spot, but again, possibly choose something that doesn't damage you in the long run. Now, the second key skill is communication, which is not just about speaking, it's also about listening. And not just any listening, but active listening. I'm gonna explain in a second. So when we are in this field as sustainability professionals, often, and I've seen this again and again in colleagues, um, we go into a meeting and we start downloading our brain and we start to overwhelm, <laughs> you know, with not, not judgment here, but this is what happens. It's normal to go there and to just showcase all that you know and all your knowledge to a potential client. But actually, the key here is shifting from your head, coming out of your head and going into the head of your client or the person going in front of you. Focusing on them entirely. That's where your communication starts to becoming effective. It's not about showing off what you know. It's about understanding the need of your client or the person you got in front of you and attend to those needs. I'm going to explain a bit better in a second. So a way of becoming a better communicator is actually to start listening actively. Stephen Covey, who is an author said, most people do not listen to understand, they listen to reply. And I bet we're all guilty of that as you know, times in life. We don't, we have our stories playing in our head while people are talking. We already think, oh, I need to say that, I need to say that, or worse, that we get distracted and think about our next meeting, our dinner tonight, whatever it is. Instead, I challenge you to just stop and listen entirely and focus the attention on the other person. Why? Because that will foster respect and attention. And I bet, again, you have felt it in your life when somebody didn't actually listen to you. And it was obvious and they were looking at their phone or, you know, the good old days, they were looking at their watch while they were talking to you. It doesn't foster respect. It doesn't, it doesn't support attention. Therefore, I would invite you to just listen just for the sake of respect. Um, the other thing is increased trust. Sorry. Hello. It's my son. This is life in 2021. Yes. Increase trust, increase trust. So that helps with, um, so listening helps others to, um, for, for you actually to become trustworthy in other size. And uh, the other one is better understanding. How do we, um, when we listen, we might as well catch a certain information that uh, you might not otherwise perceive. So it's really important to listen actively and uh, to, to try and increase your understanding. Okay, hold on one second. I'll be back in a minute. So a bit 
bit of a crisis here. Oh God, very helpfully. <laughs> School has finished, but hey, authenticity, here we are. Um, okay, another good thing of uh, uh, listening is spotting risks and opportunities that otherwise you wouldn't really, um, you wouldn't even spot. So I suggest as well that you watch this TED Talk by uh, Celeste Headley, 10 ways to have a better conversation because it's really going down to the basics. Like, don't multitask. As easy as that, don't multitask your phone, your emails that can be watched and, you know, and uh, looked at later. Sounds quite obvious, but often we don't do it. I had a senior person in my company, my previous company, who wouldn't just listen to you. They would tweet while we were, we were talking, which wasn't very respectful at all. Don't think about your dinner or your next meeting, like we were saying before. One tip there would be to jot down any thoughts you might have at that point and, um, you know, and then forget about it and go back to the person that you got in front of you. Ask open questions, especially why. That's super important to really find out what the problem is with your client. And again, if we are just talking to them without asking questions, this is not going to happen. One important aspect, so besides listening, of course, we need to speak. <laughs> so how can we speak in a more effective way? Um, your language and the content is really important and needs to be tailored to the person you go in front of you. So you wouldn't speak to a CEO the same way you would speak to a CFO, so a chief financial officer, or to an engineer. You will have different language. You will might you with a CEO, you might talk about their vision, their you know, the company mission, so higher level stuff. With a CFO, you might talk about the return on investment that you got from sustainability. With engineer, you might use your technical knowledge. But again, you will, you will possibly, hopefully, tailor what you're saying, the content and the type of language you use on the person that you got in front of you. The main thing is understanding what's in it for them. What are they interested in and deliver what they need. One thing to really watch for is jargon. So what words do you use that your friends and relatives do not understand? And you know, in this bubble, you will see all the stuff that we use every day, like carbon reporting, cradle to cradle, um, circular economy, SDGs, etc. These are not terms that the, you know, the public uses on a regular basis. So you need to really come out of your you know, technical um, say shell and understand whether you need to explain those terms or whether somebody down the street would understand you or not. It's not because you want to be patronizing towards people, but sometimes you don't, again, there is a barrier that gets created between you and another person if you happen to speak a different language. Think about alternative words, and if that's not possible, then what's clear and memorable, the, a clear memorable way to explain it. Now, if you want to use this opportunity to um, think about, and this is an exercise I really love doing, people usually find it quite uh, interesting, how would you explain to a child words like sustainable development or circular economy or another one that you might be dealing with every day. I'll give you a minute, just try and think about, maybe put in the chat, how would you use these terms with a child? Think about, you know, my son that just stormed in the room before is six. I can't talk to him about sustainable development without explaining it in very simple terms. But this exercise can help you to develop your capacity to flex your language. So I'll give you a minute. Oopsie. Okay, it's very helpful that when my son came in, I uh, deleted the bar. So 
maybe you want to unmute yourself and tell me because <laughs> I can't see the chat and I don't know whether you put something in there. So I'll give you another second. And if you don't want to share, it's absolutely fine. But hopefully going through this process, so you will understand whether you know, it's easy and probably it's not easy. I mean, the worst and the most difficult presentation I had in my life were presentations to schools. Because, well, for a starter, you try and talk about climate change without uh, scaring them. And second, how, you know, things that we give from, for granted um, are actually, you know, completely impossible to understand for a child. So, but do this, you know, maybe with your team. So when you go back to work and think about how you can change your language so that it's easier for everyone to understand. Okay, moving on to the other, uh, one other uh, skill, selling. Now, most people, when we talk about selling, say that it's, it's either yuck or difficult or um, impossible or uh, sleazy, whatever. So they'll have a negative reaction to it. And especially if you are a technical person and you're, you're really um, into sustainability from a technical point of view, you might not like selling and you think, you know, I'm a technical person, why should I sell? Reality is to sell is human. Uh, and this is the title of a book, which is quite interesting for people that are um, accidental uh, salespeople by an author called Daniel Pink. And it's so true. Better still, to sell is to serve. We negotiate our way through life. Um, when my son was here and was screaming, I said, okay, I'm going to give you something <laughs> so long as you leave me in peace because I'm working. You are negotiating, you're selling an idea, and then that person bought it and, and off you go. But we do it all the time. So it's just a matter of getting acquainted with the idea. And um, uh, this is a little cartoon um, by Lonely Tune, which I found really quite funny, but also quite true when we think about the typical salesperson. It's only 20 seconds. <laughs> Sir, I represent the Little Giant Vacuum Cleaner Company, who all along Washington. And if you watch closely, you will notice the powerful action of this machine as it removes completely and forever all foreign particles from around the room. I realize that you may not be ready to purchase the Little Giant right now, but if you ever do, just remember the Little Giant Vacuum Cleaner Company, who all along Washington. And that's it. So this is what salespeople do. They come in. They download all they know, the little speech, the little, uh, you know, the, the rehearsed speech that they have in their mind. They don't focus on the person. They did, don't ask if they need that particular product or not. And off they go again. This is the traditional way of being a salesperson. But actually, reality is, diff is different. Again, the difference is that you come out of your head and go into another person's head. You focus on them. In particular, uh, in terms of selling, um, the difference with, with the traditional way of selling is that information is now readily available to everyone. The internet is open to everyone. Everyone can uh, um, you know, find the information they need. They don't need you specifically to provide a piece of information, which is different from what happened in the past. We relied on salespeople to tell us what to buy. But unfortunately, some of these salespeople would trick us into buy something we didn't need. So that's, I think, a little bit of a legacy in terms of the past. What you there to do is to be able to curate the information because it's a plethora of information out there. How do you curate information so that it makes sense for your client? How do you create a roadmap for them? It is very impo important in that sense and is connecting to communication. Uh, how, if you are able to ask the right questions so to understand exactly what your client needs. And again, a super quote that I really like uh, is by economist Theodore Hewitt that said, or Levitt, I don't know, um, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill, they want a quarter inch hole. And what it means. So, for example, I'll give you the example of smart cities, but it could be anything. OK, this is your drill. What is it made of? It's made of open data platform. Platform is made of connectivity, is made of smart sensors, is made of digital technologies. And you will be justified if you didn't know um, until today, <laughs> maybe uh, that when you go to a new client, maybe a council, 
you talk about connectivity, digital technologies, et cetera, et cetera. But actually what your client potentially wants to have is money saving, safer roads, less traffic, efficient public services, elderly people living independently. What does it mean? They want the results, they want the whole. They don't need, or they don't care about how you get there. So this is what we need to deliver. We need to deliver what they need, the results. And that's done by starting with why. If you're familiar with the work of Simon Sinek, who's an author, really great, lots of good material on YouTube, especially his first TED talk is amazing. You start with why. What is it? We start with what's in it for them. Why should they engage with you? Why, sh why do they need sustainability? Why do they need the, your sustainability solution? So, so it's really important, again, to understand the values of your client, their objectives, their mission, their vision. And then you move on to, okay, how am I going to deliver those benefits, vision, mission, et cetera, with consultancy, with project management, with whatever you are equipped to do. Only then you will tell them, okay, the way we're going to do it is by using smart sensors, open data platforms, or whatever it is, you know, going back to the example of smart cities. I hope this is clear. Again, I can't see the chat. So this is a bit of a, a puzzled uh, <laughs> presentation, but schools are closed today. So, hey, this is what we get. But hopefully it's all clear. So most com common drivers to adopt sustainability, so most wise, are actually these five elements. Market demand. So if you want to really understand the why of your clients, usually it's because the market is demanding it now more and more. Like we said, sustainability is increasingly something that most people want. For reputation, unless you do it, you might, you know, your reputation might suffer. Or because the business is transforming over time, so they have to embrace it. For legal compliance, and this unfortunately in a way is the, the, mo the, the biggest driver at times is because they have to do it, not because they want to do it. And finally, risk mitigation, which is a big one, but very few people recognize the sustainability is managing risks. For example, supply chains, the other side of the world, um, the more sustainably they are working, the, you know, the best they're going to deliver products, the best that they're going to be protected, the better they're going to be protected by, uh, say, you know, the monsoons and the flooding and all of this stuff. So it's really important to look at risk mitigation as well. And again, going back to what we were saying in co with communication, ask open questions and listen to the answers. It's really important to understand needs, but also wants. Your clients might have needs and wants separately. They might want something, but then you realize they need something different. You are the expert. You only can tell by asking the right questions what these are and the difference between the two. And really to find out problems when nobody else did. Another important thing is to not uh, ask open questions or so how, what, uh, why, etc. but specifically why. Okay, if you don't want to adopt a sustainability, why is that? Okay, why are you saying that it costs too much? Maybe they have the wrong idea. Maybe they listen to somebody that wasn't very informed or it was for a project that doesn't apply in this case. So ask several times why, and you'll get to the bottom of the issue. Don't stop at the first one, okay? And generally speaking, the benefits are, again, divided in three. Um, they all come back to return on investment, growth or risk management. And I'm gonna show you in a second exactly what. But I often heard my colleagues say, oh, um, you know, sustainability will make you save money over time, say in buildings, because that's my main sector. And um, but if it's a developer that is building a building today to sell it tomorrow, they don't care about saving money over time. They might want to access, um, you know, might go save money on the spot or maybe sell the building quicker or access to capital that is reserved to sustainable projects etc cetera, etc cetera. so there are several other things you can mention in that case or they might be interested in, in avoiding fine in do the due diligence in protecting their brand of reputation or finally they might want to attract new customers new talent um, have an advantage over competitors or uh, you know, focus on innovation. So all of this, a very wide range of value propositions 
connected to sustainability that you can use when you are trying to influence a client to, to adopt sustainability. And a perfect way to do that, instead of just using data, which again, if you are a technical person, is what you would probably do, just giving them percentages and data and numbers, try and use a bit of storytelling. Now, this is not about dragons and princesses by any means, but it's more to do with case studies. Case studies delivered in the right way, they are powerful to demonstrate that what you want to do, what you want them to do, has been already done perhaps, or it could be done. So it, you just need to trigger that uh, oxytocin, so the hormone, the happy hormone in their head, which is triggered by good stories, so that they can envision it, so that they can embrace it in their head before it is a reality. Really, really important to do that. And as I said, in the most basic way, by using case studies. Finally, people and project management. Now, if you are a sustainability professional, you might end up uh, pro delivering projects without uh, having received any form of training in project management. So you might be juggling a number of things like clueless clients. Think somebody mentioned clients that didn't really know what to do with sustainability. New processes that might not have been done before. It's still a, you know, a young, relatively young sector. You might be involved too late to actually make a difference. You might have to deal with people that don't report to you, but you need to still to influence. You might have risky projects because again, they might not be verified before. Innovative technologies, long-term considerations. A sustainability project doesn't stop when you stop working on it. Hopefully, you will have a long, uh, you know, a lifelong uh, strategy for that particular product or project to be reused at the end. And, you know, maybe you're looking at circular economy, et cetera. Ethical considerations, the supply chain, how, you know, that particular project or product has been created, what materials were used, was the ethical labor. And then finally, juggling technical roles with uh, project management roles, very difficult. So but it can be done, it can be done. And there are a few techniques. The first will be to really understand what barriers do you have? So why you find it difficult? What are you struggling with? And then how to influence others when you don't have authority over them? So that's another thing that you need to learn. And there are several ways of going on about this but it all goes back to focusing on them and not on you. And finally, how to organize, you know, you need to organize your time, your work in a way that uh, makes sense for you. It is sustainable in the broader sense of the word and, uh, and in a way that you beat procrastination because I know that most people suffer from procrastination and really try and understand where that comes from. Is it boredom? Is it that you find it overwhelming? How can you counteract that? Perhaps you want to divide a project into smaller chunks. There are so many techniques that you can use to beat procrastination, and we talk about them in our courses. So I talked about communication, resilience, project management, and selling, and of course, technical. I wanted just to tell you this before we take questions. Um, so we are opening the Sustainable Mastermind, which is based again on this framework, is a peer-to-peer -peer group. So it's a group of people coming together from the 7th of September. Um, we, it's a four month program. We work together, supporting each other in the process of developing these key skills. So we focus on the four skills that I explained today. Uh, includes also one-to-one -one coaching with me to really uh, um, crack on, on the, you know, the nut on the head, really trying to understand what barriers you have towards success, how can you address them, what you need to do, what you need to focus on. And the applications are now open. So it's an application process because, you know, it might not be for everyone. So, but if you want to try and apply for this, um, by any means, you can scan uh, the QR code in here or go to thegregorilla.co.uk and look for Sustainable Mastermind. And you just complete the, the form and, um, you know, hopefully we can have a chat. I'm also more than happy to have a one-to-one -one chat with you uh, before you apply, just to understand whether this is something that might, um, you know, might help you. It might not, but if it helps you, then I'm more than happy to have a one-to-one -one chat with you and, uh, and talk about it. 
also, if you, because you've been so kind to be uh, watching this webinar, put up with me and my, you know, um, temperamental son. <laughs> this is a discount code that will give you 50% off uh, the Mastermind starting on the 7th of September and is Mastermind 15. So you can use that code to access your discount. Okay. Do you have any questions? Please unmute yourself because, again, I can't see... Um, I can't see the chat, which is unfortunate, but in the panic moment, you know, I'm human after all, panic moment, I deleted the bar, so I don't know how to find the chat. So if you have any questions or comments or you want to say something, please unmute yourself. And uh, or if you are on YouTube and you're watching this, maybe you might want to type something in the chat box and then I will respond later. Anyone? No, everything clear. I hope it was useful anyway, and you got a few, you know, good uh, tips there for your work. It'd be great to know whether that applies to your jobs and how it applies to your job. Um, maybe, you know, from tomorrow you can do something different, you know, commit to do one thing differently, maybe explore a bit more, one of these skills and start from there. Okay. So if there are no questions, I will say goodbye, but, Hopefully, you know how to get in touch. You can just uh, email uh, info at uh, thegreengorilla.co.uk or, again, you will find the contact form on the website. Uh, but otherwise, I will uh, speak soon. Thank you very much.